Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Texedo today, who is a neurootologist based out of Wilmington, Delaware, who did his residency in otolaryngology at Loyola University, followed by a neurootology fellowship in Chicago. Throughout his career, he's been very active in overseas medicine, has developed numerous surgical instruments, and has a significant body of teaching materials available online via his YouTube channel. He has a special interest in manifestations of migraine and ENT, balance disorders, and BPPV simulation, and 3D imaging of anatomy for teaching. Um, we're excited to have him here today for our talk, and whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and get started. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, the presentation. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, I um, have I'm a visual learner, and I've always uh, sought to have um, uh, very uh, vivid uh, physical descriptions of the uh, environments that I'm studying, and whether that is digital or actually printed, uh, uh, handheld models, uh, that's always been my way of learning. And I want to share a few of the observations uh, that I've made over time. These, for example, are otoliths that are printed uh, using real otolith uh, anatomy, uh, a morphology. You can see how they fall in a very peculiar way. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's see. Uh, so um, <clears throat> Edward Mori Bridge was a, uh, a photographer in Britain, and he uh, developed a, a method of motion capture that unlocked uh, physical phenomena that were happening just too rapidly or too simultaneously for us to fully understand. And his uh, images of horses running, of men walking, people sitting up, uh, really uh, enhanced the, uh, the study, not just for art, but for uh, medicine and, um, and uh, was a conceptual basis. It is this kind of a pr same problem that explains why the simplest of all dizzy diseases can is so complicated. There are often too many things happening at once. And uh, we have a kind of a simple concept of what BPPV is, and the uh, concept that we have doesn't, uh, uh, the, the model we use doesn't always acknowledge what uh, it is that we are uh, seeing in the clinic. So today I want to uh, present the creation of a detailed anatomical model, which I made to further my own understanding of BPPV, to introduce the BPPV viewer, which is the shareable version of that same model, um, and to review some observations of the anatomy of the membranous labyrinths, which I think are pertinent in understanding a pathophysiology that have real clinical implications. Uh, because I've had this opportunity to use a viewer to uh, look at BPPV from every angle, I uh, will review some clinical maneuvers that I have developed over time uh, because of the ability to have model visualization. And uh, my hope is that over time that uh, there will be discrepancies between the clinical observations in the clinic and model predictions uh, that can actually advance our understanding of disease. And obviously, these models can be used to create images that can improve teaching and communication so that a wider uh, population of clinicians will be available for the treatment of this very common condition. So to create a BPPV model, we needed a histologic membranous labyrinth uh, because that is the organ in which BPPV occurs. This was, uh, the difficulty was finding a labyrinth which had an intact superior anterior canal. Usually the anterior canal is cut off uh, to allow formalin to enter the labyrinth more quickly for fixation of the internal structures. But one was 
identified, which had only a very small uh, missing segment, uh, which was interpolated. It was segmented at 100 micrometers and then, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, well, a, a, a surface map was created. That map was then smoothed using, um, uh, uh, using uh, contour averaging in animation software. And then uh, we installed that into Amira and uh, in a special visualization environment at the Delaware Biotechnology Institute of the University of Delaware. Uh, they have a 17 foot cave screen with 3D. And uh, we were able to project a network in 3D that used an MRI head and then a cloned uh, labyrinth that was positioned correctly um, according to the coordinates uh, developed by Charlie Della Santina and his group down at Hopkins. So we um, created this and then um, we made the shareable version of it called the BPPV Viewer. Welcome to the BPPV Viewer a downloadable tool for study of otolith disease. In this video, we will guide you through the viewer's features and help you make the most of it. Let's begin with navigation. You can operate the tool using either a mouse or a trackpad. To rotate the model, simply click and drag. For zooming in or out, hold down the Option or Alt key and use the mouse scroll wheel. To pan, hold the Option or Alt key and move the mouse. You can select your preferred view, either orthographic or perspective. On the top right side, you'll find the navigation tool, which allows you to rotate the head at specific angular increments around the X, Y, or Z axis, as well as around the RALP and LARP planes. To use this tool, hover your mouse over the plane of interest and scroll. This tool is particularly useful for locating head positions commonly used in diagnosing and treating BPPV. The deviations along the X, Y, and Z axes are displayed at the bottom of the screen. Clicking the head in the tool will reset it to the starting position. You have the option to choose from five different background colors. The render mode lets you select an outline effect, grayscale, or return to the normal colorized version. If you prefer, you can hide the navigation tool. Click anywhere along a semicircular canal to add a spherical autolith marker. Click again to remove the marker. Feel free to add as many markers as you wish. To simulate gravity, click the activate checkbox in the lower left corner. Click pause to temporarily halt the gravity simulation. To remove all autolith markers, uncheck the Activate checkbox. Switch to the List view to display or hide various components of the model. Use the drop-down menus to access additional features, such as viewing the different Cristae planes for each canal. For a simpler view of the models, click the X button in the Menu Options to hide all menus. This concludes the BPPV Viewer walkthrough. You can download it for both PC and Mac at bppvviewer.com. Thank you for watching. So this is a free tool and I, it is starting to gain a little bit of traction and attention and people are creating their own teaching uh, materials from it. Uh, people are, uh, you know, I can see images taken from it in uh, presentations uh, that are given at more meetings. Uh, looking at the membranous labyrinth, let's take a look at a little bit of the anatomy that uh, is very important for uh, clinical BPPV diagnosis and treatment. The first is understanding that the semicircular ducts are bent toroids. <clears throat> we uh, have various theories about why the bent toroid is helpful, um, uh, but in BPPV, uh, they uh, are particularly important, especially in lateral canal disease. And you can, as you can see in the lower right, the lateral canal is the most bent of all of the toroids. 
This is the posterior canal bent toroid and the anterior canal bent toroid. We're all aware of the um, uh, posterior to anterior upward angulation of the lateral canal. And uh, the, the most very importantly, the um, non-ampulated end of the lateral canal is lower than the ampulla of the lateral canal, giving approximately an 18 degree upward angulation from side to side. Uh, this is very important because it likely uh, uh, allows uh, self-emptying of this most easily loaded of the semicircular ducts. The lateral duct um, can be divided into three uh, segments by the bent toroid uh, configuration by identifying the anterior and posterior inflections. This divides the canal into an anterior segment, an intermediate segment, and a posterior segment. Otoliths, which are in each of these segments, actually are have clinically different behavior uh, that are very important for us clinically. Obviously, uh, otoliths in the anterior segment give rise to apogeotropic forms of canalothiasis. Uh, most disease is intermediate segment disease, which gives rise to geotropic canalothiasis. And posterior segment disease um, is self-emptying. And uh, I call this pseudo-orthostasis. These are patients who get dizzy exactly one time a day. It's when they rise from lying down at night. They, they sit up at the side of the bed, look at their feet, get dizzy one time, but we cannot repeat it in the clinic. So here we can see each of those segments loaded. Gravity is turned on. The posterior segment empties. The anterior segment uh, rides toward the ampulla, and the intermediate segment remains stable in the intermediate segment as clinical disease. Um, another observation is the um, anterior to posterior elongation of the posterior semicircular duct. Uh, this uh, is a, a perfect circle, and you can see that the top segment and the bottom segment of the semicircular duct is elongated away from the conformation of the circle. Uh, you can see this better on the actual histologic. Uh, reconstruction in which the circle is imposed and we can see the elongation of the floor of the posterior duct and on the roof of the, of the posterior duct. This um, can be seen also in the uh, labyrinth from the Eaton Peabody Lab Temporal Bone Viewer uh, where the duct elongation seems particularly prominent. Uh, there's the inferior elongation and then the elongation along the uh, apex of the duct. Now that, uh, th this has uh, significant clinical consequences. Um, obviously, uh, this, uh, this straight segment of the duct down at the bottom may allow for more debris accumulation before the duct becomes obstructed uh, compared to a uniformly curved duct. Um, if, the, if we have debris in the duct um, and we have vertical head motion, uh, the debris is less likely to move on a flat surface than in the uniformly curved duct. And it also explains how otolith debris may be retained up here at the apex of the duct, which is uh, an important feature. We have a lot of patients who we think uh, erroneously have anterior canal disease and actually they have debris at the apex of the posterior canal falling back into the canal um, when we provoke their symptoms in the clinic with the hall pike maneuver. Hall -pike maneuver. So this is an important uh, problem uh, for us, especially in the diagnosis of anterior canal disease is the misdiagnosis uh, from this phenomenon. The uh, uh, po common cruise has a posterior angulation of 40 degrees, and this means that to load the labyrinth 
we have to lie down at least 50 degree, recline at least 50 degrees to bring the common cruise horizontal. But 50 degrees may not be enough because of a morphologic feature of the common cruise, uh, which you can see here. Even when angled uh, lower than 50 degrees, you can see that there is a swelling of the common cruise uh, which may act as a trap and make the post and protect uh, the posterior duct from loading as easily. This uh, swelling is also present on the anterior uh, canal, the anterior duct side of the common cruise. Um, uh, this can be seen as well in the Eaton Peabody Lab uh, viewer here and can be seen more clearly on the original uh, histologic uh, labyrinth used for the creation of the BPPV viewer. Uh, so if you're looking at other reconstructions, uh, we may wanna confirm, continue to confirm that this is a, a, a regular morphologic feature. Um, it's not one that I've heard anyone speak about. The uh, Krista planes are uh, difficult to study. They are difficult to determine even in histologic uh, studies. They do tend to be, um, they're, not, they're not perfectly perpendicular to the long axis of the duct uh, and, and they and deviate from 25 to 30 degrees from the long axis. Um, so for purposes of creating a viewer, the Krista planes were determined uh, less by uh, histological determination and more by uh, identification of null points uh, in patients clinically. The posterior cupula position um, uh, and, in, and this crystal plane, uh, the, the, it protects against cupula lithiasis. We know that this um, uh, the posterior ampulla and the base of the crista is the lowest point of the utricle and uh, debris will fall from the utricle in through the infundibulum into the uh, into this area and uh, away from the uh, cupola which rides high so that is the protective uh, anatomy the same is true if there is a debris in the duct and we lean forward, it's more, the debris is more likely to come against the base of the crista than against the face of the cupola. The, um, when we uh, see a patient with posterior cupula lithiasis, which is a relatively rare uh, condition, we can uh, uh, identify the null position 30 degrees forward uh, of vertical, and there's that would be slightly with the head tilted to the right and to the left uh, for each side. The lateral canal um, obviously is the most easily loaded of the canals, both for canal lithiasis and you would we would expect to see a lot more cupula lithiasis of the lateral canal, and in, and indeed we do. It's easy to see how uh, displaced otoliths from the utricle could fall directly into the ampulated end of the, into the ampulla of the lateral canal. They, have, they uh, the cupula planes are uh, slightly to each side. So the right cupula plane uh, is generally six to 10 degrees to, with the head turned to the right, that brings it perfectly vertical and the left uh, uh, come finds its null point six to 10 degrees with the head turned to the left. Um, we often experience after a re successful repositioning maneuver that patients will have uh, two phenomena. One is the uh, uh, downbeat nystagmus because the anterior canal has been partially loaded, but often they'll have ataxia as well. And uh, many people say, oh, well, it's obvious that things fall down onto the macula of the utricle. But I wanna make sure that we can see here that the common cruise is actually fairly far away from the utricle. 
And um, so there must be significant, with the head tilted forward at the end of a canal of three positioning, uh, then <clears throat> the uh, common cruise is in a more vertical position. And uh, loading the utricle would require a significant lateral dispersion of these otoliths as they fall out of the common cruise. And this indicates some uh, phenomena of the manner in which otoliths fall that I uh, haven't seen described. Most patients, um, most clinicians don't lean the head forward. They just have the patient sit straight up. And in this case, the common cruise empties in a position that's lower, uh, uh, lower in the utricle than the uh, macula. And uh, we would not expect uh, so much cupia uh, otolith loading, macula loading. So this is something to uh, consider. Uh, because I've had, uh, I spent many hours in the visualization cave with the Amira version of this model before it became a downloadable tool, uh, uh, that cave has 3D capability. <clears throat> I looked at uh, many maneuvers and, lo and looked through the canon of existing maneuvers and uh, came up with maneuvers that have been very, uh, very useful to me and my patients clinically and have described them in the literature. They uh, include the expanded Dix-Hallpike maneuver, modifications of brant daroff exercises for lateral and anterior canal ethiasis, a rapid sit-up maneuver for bilateral posterior canal ethiasis, and even unilateral, uh, because this seems to be easier to perform than a, um, than a simon in a large patient. And um, something called the short CRP for anterior canal ethiasis. So I'm gonna go over these along with some other observations. So the Dix-Hallpike maneuver is the foundation for diagnosis of BPPV. It was this illustration in the 1952 paper that demonstrated that the head and body could be uh, moved en masse into the provocative position without any head on body turning. This dispelled the idea that uh, BPPV was a dangerous manifestation of vertebra basilar insufficiency brought on by uh, head turning. The, the, the traditional Dix Hall Pike maneuver starts upright with the head turned 45 degrees to the side. Patient is taken down to a 30 degree head hanging position and then is brought up to sitting. The head is turned 45 degrees to the opposite side and then is brought down to 30 degrees head hanging on the other side. And this is just the way we have been taught. It was, uh, but it also is something that has created confusion and uh, I think held up a little bit of our ability to accurately diagnose BPPV. Uh, this is the way we think about it. The patient lies down, head hanging. We have this posterior canal disease, and uh, there is a maximum displacement of that otolith around the posterior canal. I'll just play that again because it was fast. So there's the posterior canal disease and the otolith falling down. Well, we always tend to see what, we're, what we know and to see what we're looking for. And the reality is that many patients have more than one thing going on. And if we had a theoretical patient who had every canal loaded, uh, they would have movement of every otolith mass and every canal with this provocative maneuver. And this seems to be a situation in which time is not doing what it is supposed to do for us. And that is to keep everything from happening all at once. Uh, so uh, I uh, also made an observation that when we move the head down to horizontal, we'll get great movement in the posterior canal, but it's not enough to create movement in the anterior canal. So the um, it may so if you do a Dix Hall Pike only to horizontal, you can clinically separate any disease that's happening in the posterior canal from disease that's happening, coming from an anterior canal. And this includes separating uh, uh, 
pseudo anterior canal disease coming or common cruise disease as it's called coming from otolis in the apex of the lowermost posterior canal. So I proposed an expansion of the Dix-Hall Pike maneuver in which the patient is brought down only to horizontal on one side and then without sitting up is turned over to the other side. Now, many would say that, oh, well, you're not gonna be able to provoke the other side because you didn't move down from sitting up. But moving down is not really necessary. That acceleration is not as important as gravity itself. You can see when we lie down with in the hall pike left position to horizontal, the right posterior canal is parallel to the earth. So we have not provoked any movement in this uh, otolith mass. No movement is provoked in it until we turn the head 90 degrees to the right, and then there will be the same amount of stimulation in this right posterior canal if disease is present as there would have been in the left posterior canal. Now we have examined the patient for posterior canalithiasis, and we know if there is any lateral movement that this is uh, a lateral canal uh, disease. Now to establish whether or not any anterior uh, canal disease is present, we can take the patient and drop the head of the exam chair so that their head is hanging 30 degrees below horizontal and this will allow stimulation from the anterior canals if needed. First on one side, then on the other side, and then the patient can sit up. And this is the way I've been uh, examining my patients in the clinic for uh, probably 10 years. Next, I'll talk about the liberatory maneuver of Simon. This is an, an, a, a simulation of it. A nice, it's the only thing in BPPV that really needs to be done quickly uh, so that the otolith mass, uh, mass does not fall backward in the semicircular duct before the second position is reached when the, pay, the, oh, the maneuver is not really complete until the patient sits up and the otolith mass transits through the common cruise. Studying uh, this, uh, we were able to show that this is not likely to be successful unless there is substantial extension of the head below horizontal. This can be done either on the beginning in the first position or in the second position. And this is important because not all patients can hang their head below horizontal when they do the uh, dix hall pike maneuver because of uh, physical limitations. So if they can't, uh, then you have to um, hang their head farther on the, on the second position side. The overall summated angles below horizontal on the, in position one and two should be 40 degrees or greater to have a successful maneuver. So this is uh, something that I would uh, uh, say is a fine point for this. I think this was recently republished as the enhanced Simant uh, uh, maneuver or the supercharged Simant maneuver, something like that. But we've been doing this uh, for a long time because of the observations we were able to make with the viewer. So um, just as the Simant maneuver is uh, successful, we have patients who have, uh, oh, uh, who have bilateral posterior canal disease and we're not sure which ear to treat first or whether we can treat them all at once uh, or have to send them home with homework. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so we um, devised a rapid sit-up maneuver, which is particularly easy to perform in an exam chair. Uh, obviously, uh, the canalith repositioning can be difficult for patients uh, in an exam chair, as can the Simant maneuver. But a patient with bilateral posterior disease, even a large patient, can lie down with their head extended. Otoliths will fall down in both sides to a new position, and then we help them to do a rapid sit-up until their face is, is parallel to the floor. They achieve this by spreading their legs astride the chair, like sitting a horse, 
in this second position. And then they hold that position for a minute to allow the otolith mass to fall to the common cruise before sitting up to complete the maneuver. So this is something that we're collecting patients to uh, write a clinical report. We have not published this uh, uh, descriptive uh, version, but probably should. Now, Brandt Daroff exercises are the are one of the uh, foundations of treatment. Uh, they uh, they work uh, pretty well, but it takes a lot of time and commitment for the patient to perform Brandt Daroff exercises. It takes about three weeks of home Brandt Daroff exercises to equal a well performed Canala three positioning uh, treatment uh, in the clinic. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, patients with lateral canal disease, and uh, many of them have BPP have had BPPV, and they know how to do Brandt Daroff exercises. So we looked to see: is there a way to modify Brandt Daroff exercises that would make them more effective? for lateral canal disease, and indeed there is. So this is a patient with right lateral canal lithiasis in, in the intermediate segment. And let's see. And we'll just show that if the patient performs a Brandt Daroff exercise but does not turn the head upward away from the floor, we can provoke much uh, larger fall around the circumference of the canal, it's a little hard to see, um, uh, than if the patient were turning their head upright. So this actually creates 90 degrees more movement around the circumference of the canal than um, a, and is more effective than traditional Brandt Daroff exercises for patients who have lateral canal lithiasis. And if you know the side of the lateral canal lithiasis, when they reach the lowest point on that side, I have them turn their head toward the floor and then back up to empty the canal before uh, proceeding. And in this way, they're doing a Guffoni maneuver again and again. So this has been useful and this is something that we've uh, published and uh, we that we prescribe for our patients. Now, a lot of, uh, of people who are beginners in BPPV get flummoxed when they are confronted with apogeotropic lateral canal lithiasis, and uh, uh, they worry a lot about it. And this is because there is a, um, uh, in the literature, the apogeotropic uh, disease is not clearly uh, separated into canal lithiasis and cupula lithiasis. But what I have uh, told people is that you don't need to worry about it. If it's cupula lithiasis, it will be consistent and long lasting um, and the response will have a null point. And, uh, but if it's canal lithiasis, you don't have to do any special maneuver. You're going to do the supine roll test just like any other patient. The only difference is that you have to really help the patient turn all the way to a lateral position in the supine roll test on each side. By doing so, anterior segment apogeotropic canal lithiasis will be converted reliably to geotropic, uh, as you'll see. So this patient has a left anterior uh, segment lateral canal lithiasis apogeotropic disease. And we're going to do a supine roll, but all the way to horizontal. So this sometimes means the patient has to be assisted uh, to roll up onto the side. But you can see that this converts the uh, disease into more identifiable geotropic disease, which we are uh, more easily able to identify uh, and treat. Anterior canal lithiasis can be uh, 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 difficult to diagnose because of the 
uh, position of the rotational axis of the anterior canal, the rotational component can be harder to identify, is harder to identify than in posterior canal disease. Uh, we, uh, when we can identify the, uh, <clears throat> the side, we can easily treat uh, with the CRP uh, maneuver, but uh, position, the, the, the traditional position with the head rolled toward the floor can be eliminated. It's, it's absolutely redundant. So we call this the short CRP maneuver. So <clears throat> this patient has right anterior canal disease. They're brought into the traditional head hanging Dix Hall Pike position. This provokes motion of the otolith mass from near the ampulla, uh, more toward the apex of the canal. They're, they rotate 90 degrees, and this brings the canal vertical and, um, and uh, ensures progression of the mass toward closer to the common cruise. And at this point, no further rotation is helpful or necessary. <clears throat> they can simply sit up. And when they sit up, the otoliths will fall down through the common cruise. So this has been uh, published. And is one of the simplest ways to treat if you are sure of the side of disease. Of course, um, even I, uh, with anterior canal disease, like the simplicity of the Yakovino maneuver, which was initially described with the head hanging. It's, it's a short version of the, of the prolonged forced position procedure. And you ha hang the head for just a few minutes and then with the head 30 degrees up uh, for three minutes and then sitting up to complete the maneuver. But it seems that this intermediate position is not even necessary, as you'll see. So we propose a more efficient, uh, simple head hanging to move the otolith mass uh, past the apex of the canal. And once that is effective, the patient may sit up and the canal uh, should empty. So this is the simplest treatment and the simplest disease to treat in the office. And it's easy for patients to do at home if they have nice neck extension. Now, <clears throat> we love Brant Daroff exercises. And I thought, well, what if there was a way to treat, to modify Brant Daroff exercises uh, so that uh, we could treat anterior disease? And indeed, there is. But the patient has to be able to hang their head below horizontal toward their shoulder um, to achieve a good treatment result. This is really a Brandt Daroff modification of the RACO maneuver, which was a sideline position with the head hanging toward the shoulder. And uh, but when we are going to have patients go home and do a repeatable maneuver, we can teach them how to do this with the head hanging, and uh, anterior canal disease can be effectively treated. So uh, Brandt Daroff exercises figure heavily in my treatment paradigm. Now, um, it, going forward, the, um, we hope to continue to improve the BPPV viewer. We are uh, ready for updates, and we're open to suggestions for what you users might like to see in it. Obviously, we'd like to add eye movements. Uh, we would like to um, add motion capture so that you can uh, easily create videos of your own. We'd like to see the, um, the labyrinth be transparent and make intraluminal otolith markers uh, that uh, make a, a more physiologic appearing uh, simulation. Although we didn't do that initially because they, um, they were too difficult to see um, uh, and required too much study. The uh, larger otolith markers were vivid and easy. And finally, uh, with uh, we are now uh, 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 early developers uh, using Apple AR glasses with and we have uh, patent protection in the US and Europe for uh, uh, use of the uh, AR glasses so that it will identify facial anatomy and position visible labyrinths uh, with movable otoliths 
uh, around any patient's head. This way, once we confirm their diagnosis, we can add a nodolith marker at its expected position and treat the patient, but also um, treat the labyrinth model uh, by moving the patient uh, uh, with gravity. Uh, to, and we think that this will be a, an excellent training tool and may have um, a clinical application and help improve the effectiveness of maneuvers that are performed by the army of, uh, of primary care physicians and physical therapists who most of these patients depend on for treatment. Obviously, we are few in number. Uh, otolaryngologists, neurologists, otoneurologists, compared to the army of physical therapists. And unfortunately, the competency among them is low. This kind of a tool, I think, can improve competency and uh, improve our ability to manage this very common disease. Now, giving patients homework um, is uh, always a little difficult. And uh, especially uh, patients have a very difficult time translating printed instructions into accurate maneuvers. So I have made this homework sheet and you, I would encourage you to make your own. Uh, this, uh, these are all video links to different maneuvers. You know, Brant Daroff, this is an, how to understand BPPV in one minute, Brant Daroff exercises, Canal of three positioning for the right, for the left, uh, the modified brant Daroff exercises, and so on. So if I give someone homework, I say, this is your homework. I write in this box, uh, uh, do two times a day for a week. And uh, I haven't had any problem. Everyone has family members who can show them how to use these QR codes if they're not familiar. And this has been a big enhancement uh, for patients. Now, the other thing I need to do is to help enhance the competency of the physical therapists who many of these patients see. And um, so I've been able to use the illustration capacity of the viewer to create clear illustrations of how all of these maneuvers uh, in a small cannon are to be performed. So this is an outline of posterior canalithiasis, of lateral canalithiasis treatment, and anterior canalithiasis treatment. And this helps develop the competency of the, of the clinicians and to give them options. So if one patient, if, if one uh, <clears throat> sequence isn't working or is not accessible to a patient because of physical limitations, that then they can um, uh, find another option that, uh, that can be performed by that patient. Now, one of the things that has occurred to me over time is that we really don't know very much about otoliths. <clears throat> uh, and uh, we certainly always talk about how we, we about how far they move. If you rotate 90 degrees around the axis of a of a can of a duct, do they really fall 90 degrees? Uh, we're not sure. And when do they start falling? Uh, the angle of repose is a concept that I think is very applicable here. And that's the maximum angle at which an object can rest on an inclined plane without sliding down. And that is a, uh, has to do with the friction between the particle and the plane. But it also uh, has to do with how a particle interaction itself, every material has its own angle of repose. And these otoliths <clears throat> um, have a very unique geometry. Uh, but we don't know very much about how these otoliths actually interact. They're not spheres, but most of the otoliths, um, but most of the uh, engineering simulations uh, of otolith disease, which predict drag, hydrodynamic drag, assume the otoliths are spheres, but they clearly are not. And as you'll see in this uh, little uh, video at the top, these printed otoliths, which are anatomically accurate, don't drop like torpedoes. They float sideways. And the uh, rhombohedral faces uh, seem to keep them from rotating. These are hexagonal uh, rods. And you can see this is one face, a second face, and a third face. And these are the rhombohedral faces. 
Um, but we don't know how they really act. We do know, just in casual observation, if we put too many of these uh, uh, otoliths in uh, to um, a tube, they start to clump together and even stack up in irregular ways with two or three otoliths at the bottom, but then an inverted pyramid above them because the hexagonal um, uh, sides and the rhombohedral faces seem to be able to interlock uh, in a way that may be important in understanding otolith disease. So um, I think we need to study this. Uh, we have gotten uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Walther in, in Germany, uh, whose illustration this is, the actual uh, surface dimensions created a surface map and uh, Patrick Esmond at Vestibular First created an otolith generator so that you can actually create uh, surface maps of uh, that are printable of any otolith size and with uh, a degrees of variation. So you can produce uh, 10 or 50 or 1,000 otoliths and then uh, print them, and then you can use these things uh, to create simulations. So this is something that I think is going to be interesting. We want to get people interested in studying the dynamics of these particles. So, um, uh, and I'll just show you, uh, we've been having fun with this. You saw those otoliths falling. Um, we have been, uh, where is, uh, you can see that we are, you know, you can print these otoliths. This is um, a lot of them that are like the ones falling through the fluid. You can print them in different densities. Um, as you get them bigger, you can under, you can see the hexagonal rod shape and the rhombohedral faces. Uh, you can see how uh, you can get them bigger and bigger. You can see how these faces are parallel to one another on opposite ends of the of the crystal. And um, I we encourage people just to have fun with it. Uh, we've had we have had fun with it. This is actually a regulation size otolith. Uh, Michael, I don't know if we're seeing the same thing you are. We're still seeing the vestibular first otoconia generator. Is that what you were oh. showing us? Oh, can you see me? Let me just, I, I was doing a demonstration. I was holding some things. Oh, okay. You were holding them up in the, sorry. Yeah. So can you see me now? Yeah, got you. Okay, good. So anyway, we're showing how you can print these smaller otoliths. And uh, that, but but holding physical models helps you to really make observations. So these are um, very interesting to look at. You can see the hexagonal rod form, the rhombohedral faces. And uh, I was just showing how much fun we've been having making even regulation size otoliths uh, that you can make with the otoconia generator. So th that's a free thing that uh, Patrick Esmond made and um, we encourage people to play with it. Can you throw a tight spiral with that? Um, it is a dangerous to catch. <laughs> so we've um, uh, presented the creation of this model and uh, introduced the BPPV viewer, uh, made some observations of the anatomy of the membranous labyrinth. And I um, showed you some of the clinical maneuvers that uh, were developed because of having the model to observe. And I just hope that this is gonna be helpful in an advancing understanding that people will use it as a communication tool, much the way the EPL viewer has been used in otology, in discussions, for example, of exactly where to make cochleostomies and uh, things like that. Um, all of the videos that I showed and many of the simulations that we made are on, on my YouTube channel and you can download them and take a look at them. Um, and um, and uh, obviously all of this work doesn't happen alone. Uh, we um, had an inbreak grant and we had a, a former fellows. We had a computer uh, a science and engineering students, uh, Rindy Northrup at the Temporal, Temporal Bone uh, Foundation uh, helped with the uh, 
and actually was the driving force between uh, for the segmentation of our initial labyrinth. So that's what I have to present. I hope that's interesting to you. Well, that was uh, that was just mind opening, over the top, terrific. Um, so we've got time for questions, uh, which is good. I'll just. John Lee wanted to know uh, something about the variability of the orientation of the cupola, the canals. How much would this variability um, affect your interpretations of uh, the clinical presentation and treatment? Um, well, I don't know if there, uh, I think the variability could be within a few degrees. Uh, I think the most, most uh, studies show that the canals are very, very closely orthogonal within an individual. It's the positioning within the uh, within the head and relative to Reed's plane that can vary because of the uh, uh, just differences in morphology. The canals uh, and, and the falling of otoliths around the circumference of the canals really uh, function as, you know, are really dominated by a tangent function. So a few degrees off uh, probably doesn't change things very much. I think I was just interested at the yeah. beginning when you presented the you know the anatomy. What, that was based on how many sample what sample size to, to actually come up with the bending of the toroids and so forth. Oh, this is just this is just uh, the this particular labyrinth, and it, but it's consistent with the EPL viewer. I mean the bent. Okay, toroids so it's n equals one. Now has been shown. I think almost everyone who has published papers uh, with their own segmented membranous labyrinths has the bent toroid shape uh, uh, represented. So I think this is a, a clinically very important. And how variable are the otoconia? Oh, uh, there's a big variation. They can be short, they can be long, but they have a particular uh, uh, structure that uh, uh, is very dense a calcite that radiates from a central point and, and which terminates in the rhombohedral faces at the ends of the otoconia. But then uh, that is filled. So this is like two ice cream cones that are connected by a point deep inside. And then the space in between is filled with more porous uh, calcium and protein. And this is, so when otoconia degenerate, they de degenerate from the from the central portion, and then they tend to break apart uh, at this uh, narrow connection of the most dense core. And I think I think th those uh, fragments have been seen in um, uh, in uh, specimens. Thanks. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, be, I want to ask a quick question, and then we'll get get to the chat. Um, uh, I read a recent paper from Carol Foster and one of her uh, colleagues basically saying they don't think cupulothiasis exists. That's number one. And number two, what about uh, canal jams and plugging of the canal? Is, is that a big problem? Uh, you know, and obviously, as you said, there's not a smooth, a smooth road through the canals. I think uh, in... Clinically, for me, I have not been uh, very impressed that canal jam is a big uh, clinical problem. Um, it, if, if anything, it would uh, be something that interrupts an individual treatment session, uh, but is not a kind of disease. Um, I would say that most patients with uh, uh, who might have something like that, that would be overcome by repeated maneuvers. Now, cupula lithiasis, um, I'm familiar with uh, what you're mentioning, the, uh, this, this notion that cupula lithiasis may not exist, but it's really difficult to uh, conceive that um, it doesn't exist when you have patients uh, who have a null point and reversing the stagmus on opposite sides of that null point that corresponds to the action of that particular canal. Um, I'm not sure I understood what her 
uh, alternate I think, hypothesis. I think they they suggested this was due to canal jams uh, and plugs. In, in, in other words, making a cupola somewhere else. Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, that's interesting. And if so, then that would be, uh, um, uh, I, I guess that's an open question. We'd have to sort out a way that uh, could uh, potentially, um, I think the, the existence of a null point would seem to, uh, at, at the site of the known cupola is uh, pretty strong evidence. Uh, it may, may be that other phenomena actually does exist sometimes, but I don't think I've seen it. I don't know, have you? Uh not sure. Okay, so uh, Rick Rabbit wants to show a movie, and is, let's do that right after Dave Newman Toker's question. Uh, thanks for an amazing talk. Uh, that was fantastic, Michael. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is um, kind of a, a, a question about uh, degeneration and absorption. Uh, when these, when we dump this stuff back into wherever we dump it out of the canals, uh, you know, the, the utricle or other places. The What do we know about the reabsorption rate of these otoconia and uh, how long people are susceptible with a given bout if we get the stuff out of the canals? And does that vary uh, depending on how narrow the space is where they're sort of stuck? Like if it's a bigger space, then they reabsorb faster. Do we know anything about that? That's question one. Uh, sort of dissolving of crystals idea. And the second is um, the <clears throat> some of the things you hinted at are superb for thinking about how we can make the kind of um, minimum set or least move strategy, uh, mm -hmm. say in places like primary care or the emergency department, thinking about kind of cutting it as short as possible. I love the revised approach to Dick's Hall Pike testing, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit about um, what you see as kind of the minimum set of um, for the the basic variants of posterior canal BPPV and the the geotropic variant of horizontal canal plus minus apogeotropic. If there's sort of a kind of a simplified version that you like to teach to people in primary care for both the diagnosis and treatment process. Yes, I, uh, I, I think I, I'm really interested in that. Um, I don't know very much, and I don't know how much really is known about the actual um, rate of absorption or turnover. There is even some controversy about whether or not there is uh, actual uh, significant regrowth of new otoconia uh, and turnover of otoconia in man. Uh, uh, so uh, I know that there are notions and evidence of pinocytotic Reingestion of, of otoconia by dark cells at the base of the posterior crista where, and, and in the dark cells surrounding the macula of the utricle. But I haven't, um, I'm, I'm not up to date on any uh, new concepts in those areas. As far as efficiency of disease, um, I would say the, uh, the, I use the expanded Dix Hall Pike maneuver and then. I would have a kind of, uh, of of clinic treatment, one for normally mobile individuals and one for immobile, and usually that means obese individuals, um, for posterior canal disease, for lateral and anterior, and then a home version, some homework, uh, one best homework to do for each of those. And so um, uh, I you teach the expanded Dix Hall Pike maneuver. Right, Once that's there, I, 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 if a patient is large uh, in the clinic, I like the CRP. And if they are, uh, if they're, but if they're large and immobile, we do the rapid sit up maneuver because that can be done in the exam chair. Then we can send them home with uh, Brandt Daroff exercises. This gives them a sense of control over their disease and less dependence on the uh, healthcare system 
uh, if they have recurrent disease. And many of these patients, as you know, do recur. If they have lateral canal disease, um, obviously the log roll is the, um, is the uh, standard maneuver, but I think the Gufoni maneuver is the one that is preferred, especially if the patient is obese and you can, almost everybody can do the Gufoni maneuver. And then at home, they can do the lateral modification of brand Darof exercises. And for anterior canal lithiasis, we do the short CRP uh, in the clinic, or if we can't tell which side we, and, and they can extend, then we do the uh, Yakovino maneuver and we can send them home if they're able with the, uh, with the mo Brandt Daroff modified for uh, anterior disease. So that would be a, a small uh, treatment set that could be teachable and usable um, uh, both in the clinic and at home that's useful for the clinician for difficult patients and useful at home so that patients have a sense of control over the disease when it occurs. Thanks so much. That's great. Rick, can you show us your video? Michael, the... that, was, that was just a fabulous talk. Um, I do have a little video I thought you might find interesting, especially with respect to how the canaliths might reposition as they're sedimenting. Um, I think to do it, though, I have you have to stop sharing. Yeah, let me do that. Um, I'm going to stop to share. OK. OK, let's try this. OK, if you can see that, what you're looking at is a semicircular canal in the toadfish that's outlined with red. And then that fuzzy part in the middle is a glass pipette that's loaded with 10 micron diameter beads. And the animal is oriented relative to gravity, so the beads sediment down the canal. And if you watch closely, I think you can see them self-separate. You're going to hear at the same time a multi-unit afferent recording, hopefully. Oh, I don't have audio for some reason, but you see the beads self-separating yeah. and sedimenting down the canal, which I thought was really interesting. So they go to the uh, the bottom of the canal lumen, and then they slide along the bottom and self-separate into a line. Um, this actually has audio, but I don't know why it's not playing. But you can hear the uh, units increase in their discharge rate as they accelerate and head towards the ampulla, and once they sediment in the ampulla, the beads, uh, the afferents go back to zero. Not sure why it's not uh, playing there. And then another thing I thought was real. I'm sorry. Even with that small volume of particles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big response, even with those small guys. Um, maybe I can try bringing up it again. Well, we're, we're over on time, Michael. So I'll, I'll send you a copy of that if you're interested in it. Oh, with, I love that. Yeah. That with would the be video. Cool. I mean, with the audio. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, I think um, we, it, this was great. Um, and I've used the viewer, and it's really nice way to kind of get some sense of what's going on. But I would like to just finish with saying what Michael said at the very beginning that this is the most complicated disease that I know of in terms of understanding it, but it's the best disease because you make patients so happy without any other tests. So thanks a million. Looking forward to uh, that upgrade of your viewer and publish all that stuff so we can all use it. Yeah, I've got to stop having so much fun in other places. <laughs> well, I, I won't tell you how to lead your life, but... <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you next week. It's great work. Thank you for joining us. It was fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that was so Is there like